Welcome to this episode of Therapy and Theology. My name is Lisa Turkhurst, and I'm here with my teammates, Dr. Joel Mutamale from Proverbs 31 Ministries and licensed professional counselor, Jim Kress. We're so thankful Compassion International has partnered with us to sponsor this season of Therapy and Theology. Compassion brings real solutions to poverty that so many children in today's world are facing, all in Jesus' name and through the generosity of sponsors like you and me. Visit Compassion.com slash Proverbs 31 or click the link in our show notes to join me in sponsoring a child today. In this season, we're focusing on how to be more self-aware. We all want to grow, but sometimes we have a difficult time determining what it is that's keeping us from truly healing and becoming more of the person God made us to be. As we dive into each episode, I encourage you to download a free resource I put together titled, What's It Like to Do Life With Me? This resource will help you find out what it's like for others to interact with you by working through insightful questions with a trusted friend. Now, let's dive in. Okay, so today we're talking about self-awareness, but first I felt like it would be good for us to have confession time. <laughs> Why are you looking at me to start? Hold because on. he's eager <laughs> to I, share his no, confession. No, you that's not true. Are always eager. <laughs> that, okay. I feel like I got set up. So name something that you go, oh, why do I do this? Why do I do what I don't want to do? Okay, so I just want to start by saying on Tuesday nights, I play basketball. And y'all need you to know this last Tuesday night, I had the best game of my life. Like I average, we play like games up to 18 points. I average like six to nine points, which I just only there shoot three pointers. There's video, yes. Okay. okay? Wow. And I crushed it. <laughs> three game winning shots. All right. So I'm so but this is the thing. Like, why do I do the things that, that I do? You know what? Hold on. <laughs> I am so impressed right now that you just wrote a book on theology. I mean, not, you just wrote a book on humility. humility. <laughs> And now Please. you're bragging. So this is epic. We just need to pause and receive this. Okay, right. go ahead. God teaches us humility in so many ways. Um, <laughs> so so here's so okay. The, here's the thing. I Brett made the most incredible dinner right before, and she knows that I play basketball on Tuesdays, so it's a great protein filled like dinner, you know. And I'm good, and we're on a budget. Like we're like, hey, we're going to be really careful with what we're spending. We've got some goals, and it's really good. And I don't know how this happens, but I get done and I drive down the same road every time to come, you know, back home. And without even knowing it, I don't understand this, Jim, I'm going to need your help. I make a right turn and then another right turn and then do a little curve. And all of a sudden, I'm ordering a number four Crunchwrap Supreme with a soft taco instead of a hard shell taco with a bunch of fire sauce and a Baja Blast. It's called classical conditioning, (laughs) steady Pavlov's dogs. Your mouth is watering, they ring the bell, and you're in Taco Bell. See the bell. The Taco Bell. Bell right there. And then I but then here's the thing, then I get out and I eat my Taco Bell in the parking lot by myself. And I just wonder, why do I do and sometimes I'll even have this mental thought as I'm leaving the gym. Like, no, no talk about it, Joel, you're gonna do it. This time you're gonna go straight home, it's gonna be great. And right turn, right turn, go to the curve, in the line, order my number four. Brittany is for sure gonna want a favorite this episode right here. <laughs> She's been waiting for this moment for yes. you to say, I should not be doing this. I should not be doing this. this is okay, I guess it's my turn now. Why do I do what I don't want to do? My mouth keeps saying yes when my brain mm. is absolutely screaming, no, mm. don't. You don't have time. You don't have the capacity for this. Say no, say no, say no. And then my mouth is like, of course, I would love to do that. Why do I do <laughs> what I don't want to do? Your turn, Jim. Mine is, and we'll get to this in one of the episodes, but I was either born with or quickly developed, seriously, an anxious attachment style. Mm. And so inside, that has really grown and transformed with a lot of therapy. Why do I do what I don't want to do in this? Or sometimes, why do I do what I do? Why did I just do that? Is I will at times still react instead of respond, no matter how much I've taught or written about it or spoken on it, especially if I'm tired Mm -hmm. or stressed and I go to a reaction mode when I feel like, Jimbo, you know better, but I still do it. Okay, so we asked our listeners for some more examples, and so this is, these are some of their answers. Mm-hmm. So why do I say yes to that person every time? Why am I always running late? Mm. Why can't I ever get it together or get ahead? Why do I always feel like it's my fault? Why do I never feel like it's my fault? Why do I always try to manage other people's emotions and feelings? Whew. 
why does this person always get the worst side of me? Why do I always feel like I have to say something? Mm. Silence should be mm. an option, right? Why do I keep doing this? Why am I still tempted by this? Why do I keep saying things that don't match my true heart's intent? Okay, so maybe there's some other ways that you may be asking this question. Why do I do what I don't want to do? Like, why can't I just make progress? Why can't I get rid of blank? Um, maybe it's that feeling. Maybe it's anxiety. Um, why does relational drama keep coming up in my life? Mm -hmm. Why can't I put boundaries into practice? Mm -hmm. And also, I feel like sometimes we're so acutely aware of our faults that we can even just berate ourselves, just speaking yeah. to ourselves with an mm -hmm. overactive conscience. So, Joel, why do we do this from a theological standpoint? What do you have to say? And Jim, from a therapy standpoint, mm -hmm. what do you have to say? Yeah, I think from a theological standpoint, we, we always have to be aware that there is a motivation that is driving us as human beings. Like, so for instance, in like, there are these early church theologians, Martin Luther and John Calvin, and they have this Latin saying, uh, which basically is uh, the heart bent in, in, co in covetous and say. And what that means is that okay. The, wait, what did that? What is that phrase? In curvitus and say it's a Latin the heart, phrase. The heart caved is in. caved in or bent in, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. And so this is really important. In the opening pages of Genesis, we have this idea that God creates humanity with an object of affection, and that object of affection is God Himself. They're always designed to have an ambition, a drive, a desire to pour out love onto God, and then to rightly, this is super important, appropriately pour out love to each other. This also includes creation because they're supposed to be, guess what, good stewards of creation, of the animals, of the plants. Like there's this balanced order here. What sin does, sin doesn't turn off that love. Sin mm. doesn't turn off the ambition or the desire. What sin does, and this is another theologian, modern day, James Smith, who says it this way, that what sin does is if your heart is a pump that is pouring out love and the object of affection was always supposed to be God, what sin does is it knocks that heart pump off kilter. Mm. And no longer is it is it pouring, desiring love out uh, to the appropriate and proper object of affection. It's being curved inward. Mm. And we're actually pouring out love onto ourselves, which mm. means we have desires and ambitions and we do the things that we do because there's an undercurrent of desire that we believe we're going to get something out of it. And at the very bottom of that is this hidden, passive, subversive doubt that God can actually be the fulfillment of the thing that you're actually longing for. So that's so interesting, Joel, because my confession that I made is why does my mouth keep saying yes when my mind is saying no? Mm -hmm. And I think we will always be desperate to get from other people what we fear yeah. we will never get from God. And so I think the reason that I'm saying yes is not just to people please. It's not, it's not that I just want to make everybody happy. It's because the person I'm doing with this with, they have something I don't want them to take away from me. Mm. So either they have acceptance of me or they, they're fun and I don't want them to think poorly of me or I really want them to um, love me or admire me or you know respect me. And so I'm afraid if I say no, then they will take that love, respect, and honor away from me. So I'll say it again, we will always we will always desperately try to get from other people what we fear we will never get from mm, God. Right. So I know that's like a big, deep answer yeah. to why Good do one. I say yes when my mind says no, but I think it, it is more serious than that. I do think it comes back to I fear that maybe God won't provide the same mm. good today feelings of I'm loved, I'm accepted. You know, I um, people are, are happy with me, you mm -hmm. know, and and they're not going to reject me. And so I think sometimes I fear that I don't know how to get the tangible feeling from God. I know it with my mind. God loves me. God respects me. You know, God um, adores me like mm -hmm. I am his child. You know, he, he sees me as an image bearer of Christ. I know all of that with my mind. But sometimes my heart goes searching out here. And I think you're right. It's yeah. because the love pumped is, not, is knocked off kilter. Mm -hmm. And so I'm desperate to get those things from other people, which then 
throws me into trying to please them so they'll give me what I really want them to give me. You've just eloquently described when I talk about people pleasing in my own life or in the life of others, when I'm people pleasing, the number one person I'm really trying to please, trying to please is myself. People pleasers, been one many times, we're actually very powerful. We're not weak because I will feel like I can, almost like you're a vending machine, come in and put my quarters in and get out of you what I want, your approval mm -hmm. or your blessing. And you, you've also just described, Lisa, there, what I would call and others would probably call a scarcity mentality in relationships. I'm not enough. I'm not enough to stand on my own two feet in and of myself. And so we want to examine that or there won't be enough. Or if I do X, Y, or Z or have boundaries, if I dare to say no, then I might lose access to you, relationship with you. And maybe I'm not even thinking about what is the quality of that relationship I have with you already. Hmm. But uh, I, there was an old show called Hee Haw. It had a song in it that said, if it weren't for bad luck, I would I'd have, have no, no luck, luck at, at all. all. So I've said that to people. <laughs> John I'd, doesn't know this one because he's too young. Youngins. We're yeah. old. Yeah, I mean, we're I old. Trust you. And I'm really old. But it's like I'd rather take a bad relationship mm -hmm. or maybe an unhealthy or even toxic relationship than no relationship at all. So I've said a bunch, and you both have heard it, that what I don't work out in my life, there's a good chance I'm going to act out. So we've said many times right here on this program, if it's hysterical, it's historical. Okay. So in me, what might be going on me, inside me, in my story, maybe some unfinished business from the past that sets me up to hustle for my worthiness. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, there's always a payoff. I, what are you getting out? I'm getting nothing out of hustling here or the scarcity mentality or people pleasing. No, there's always a payoff or we wouldn't do it. Discovering what that payoff is, that's another story. Yeah, so like in Joel's case, yummy tacos. And the feeling, honestly, what I think the Taco Bell thing is, okay, sorry, me, I'm not me. a therapist, so Jim, yeah. correct me if I'm about to ruin his life. But yeah. I really think it's that you feel like you are in control and nobody can boss you around. Yeah. And you go to the Taco Bell and you order what you want and you eat what you want and nobody sees. Yeah. So it's almost as if it didn't happen. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Jim, you Well, you remember we talked about this before? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're also a bit dissociated. Mm -hmm. That's not a bad word. We all dissociate a little bit because are you sitting in the car just staring off into oblivion or are you watching something on a device? <laughs> while you, no, let's be honest about it. And I'm a big fan. You've got the olfactory senses. Everything's involved. I, yeah. When you're talking about this, I literally am sitting here craving Taco Bell, like yes. right now. Yeah. Lunch is coming. Yeah, I do. But I watch first take. No, you've got <laughs> a perfect, it, but it's honest, you've got a yeah. perfect environment to go. Plus, you have been on the basketball court, whether you played well or not. Neurochemically, you've been in a rush. Mm. All that stuff going on in your body, all those neurochemical processes going on, they'll begin to wane and come down. So it's a quite of a comforting thing to be there and to distract and to dissociate yourself in a healthy way, probably, mm -hmm. for a little bit. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And I think, to some extent, we're also factoring in some unspoken rules mm -hmm. that maybe we acquired through Christianity yeah, or good. maybe even through our family of origin. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was having a conversation recently with Maddie Vincent. She works here at Proverbs 31 Ministries. Her, her last name's Greenfield now. Oh, <laughs> she just got we married, interrupt this program yeah, for the yeah. following name change. Mads, yes. I got you, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I have this issue. I when when my, when all my friends and staff members get married, I don't change their name in my phone. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so this just happens. I still yeah. know them. Okay, whatever. Yeah, Sorry, you. Maddie. Okay, <laughs> but I was having this conversation with her, and I, you know, there in Christianity and in my family of origin. I have felt so long that it's like, you should do this, and you should do this, and you should do this. And anytime I start to feel this shouldness mm -hmm. being put on me, then it makes me feel like I have to do this or I'm not a good Christian. I have to do this mm -hmm. or I'm not a good daughter. I have mm -hmm. to do this or I'm not a good friend. Mm -hmm. I have to do this or I'm not a good employee of Proverbs 31 Ministries. The pressure's on. I'm mean, feeling it as you, I'm like, wow, the pressure's on there, isn't it? And yeah. to some extent, we do have responsibilities with all of those things, mm -hmm. absolutely. And there are rules that need, to, need mm -hmm. to be followed. There are commands of God that need to be honored and followed. But I think what happens to me is outside of the 
biblical truths that I do need to follow and outside of the expectations of my work or even my friends, I start taking those shoulds and putting them on myself Mm -hmm. and then I turn them inside of me and it feeds like a condemnation. Mm -hmm. So the conversation I was having with Maddie was she had this revelation. What if we changed from I should do this, which can feed condemnation and all of that, to I could do this. That's Mm -hmm. good. And I think that's a much more empowering way to do it. Like when a friend asks you to go to dinner, instead of feeling like I should do this, like I've got a lot going on tonight, but I really should go out to dinner with this friend on this particular night just because they made a request. But what if we say to ourselves, I could. I could go to dinner with this person. I could choose to. Or I could choose to go home and do what I need to responsibly do and offer another night for dinner to this friend. Mm -hmm. Just because someone makes a request, their request should never be our absolute demand. You know, we can respect their request and certainly different roles. If it's a boss, then you need to honor that request, right? right? But I think sometimes in life, like a friend will make a request. Suddenly we feel like their request is automatically our responsibility or our demand. And so we push ourselves past our capacity Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then we shame ourselves. I should do this, I should do this, I should do this. And sometimes I even do it out of guilt Mm. so they don't feel that condemnation rather than a true joy of getting together with a friend. You just went where my mind went, should and shame both. I'm a simple guy. Uh, They should and shame both start with SH. And it's also like shh to your true voice or yourself. And I, I think the more shoulds that are there, then it's going to lead to shame, which we've said often that is self-hatred at my expense. There was also- Let's a th- not rush past that. Let's okay, say yeah. it one more time. Shame could be an acronym for self-hatred at my expense. I can hate myself and it will cost me a lot. The problem is, that's not even a problem. The reality is, shame is an attempted antidote to pain. People say, why would I shame myself or should myself? It does release chemicals inside me that it'll be an attempt to numb out some pain or some reality. And so I use these permission slips like, huh, you asked me, thank you, Joel, let's go to Taco Bell. I want to give myself permission in authenticity and in these series coming up, we're going to talk about lying and even self-deception to say, huh. Well, like we have some back. shocking statistics We do. <clears throat> and I can say, you know, thank you, and that doesn't work for me. Or thank you, I use this a lot truly in all my relationships. Thank you, and I don't have that to give. Now listen to the ticking <clears throat> of the clock. I don't need to say more. I want to say, that's about me. And I don't have to be a jerk. We've said children explain, adults inform, thank you, and that doesn't work for me. Just pay attention for a second why you need to say more. Now, if you're free to say, but hey, next week, let's do that. By the way, if you say to a friend, let's get lunch and phones don't come out immediately for you to schedule it, it's usually a little bit bogus. But I want to keep giving myself permission at age 61 for me as I get older to say, I have this to give and I have that not to give and I don't have to explain it. And then I also can worry, well, what are you going to think about me? At one level, you know, what you think about me is really not my business. Mm. I don't have to be mean about it, but I could say, I'd love for you, I would, to love have your approval, but if not, then I grant you the ability to be disappointed with and by me. I really, I really love that. And what's insightful about that is what you both are describing is ordered responsibility Mm -hmm. through evaluation. So Mm. we're talking about Mm self-awareness, you know? So how in the world are you and I going to be able to be, uh, to make right decisions about requests that come our way Mm -hmm. or about situations that are happening in our life? I think when we're unable to do that, that's actually evidence of disordered responsibilities Mm. in our mind, in our heart, and in our being, you know? And so theologically, the the idea of the heart, the Hebrew word is lab, and, and, we think uh, disconnected. We think the heart is emotion, the mind is intellect, and then the body is doing between the tension of these two things. Well, the ancient Israelites don't think in that way. They're thinking that the, the lab, the heart, is the wellspring of emotion, the wellspring of intellect. It is the place where all of these aspects of what our humanity is, is ordered, It is um, evaluated so that our our actions do the right things. And so in terms of self-awareness, we have got to be able to figure out the right order of responsibility so that we can make informed decisions when it comes to it. That's so good, Joel. And I think 
having a response already prepared mm. for situations that are going to come up. And I think that's really helpful. And mm -hmm. also, I need to be self-aware enough that I don't want that, that answer to betray who I really am and how yeah. deeply I really do care in this relationship. So my prepared statement that I came up with is, while my heart says yes, 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 mm -hmm. the reality of my time makes this a no. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I've stolen, I borrowed that. I'm not going You're to welcome to. From you because it's so, and it's so grace filled. I want to honor that of you. I've used that from you. And I'm like, that's so good. Okay, so we've talked about like, why do I do what I don't want mm -hmm. to do in terms of I keep doing this, keep going to talk about, mm -hmm. I keep people pleasing. And so why don't we turn it a little bit? So why am I so tempted by this? Mm -hmm. And that gets a little bit into your Taco Bell situation, but mm -hmm. I wonder if it, if we could go just a little further, not just mm -hmm. I keep doing this and I should or could not do it, but what if it's a temptation that really it needs to stop? I think uh, if I may speak to that first here, I think often just of simple operating systems, we're all uh, used to that. My iOS on my iPhone, I woke up this morning and it had operated, uh, it had uh, updated to the new system. It does that quite regularly. If I've been in a PC kind of operating system in my own life, family of origin, et cetera, and then I come to Mac people, sometimes people say, you're one of those Mac people, or you're a PC, you're a dinosaur or whatever, and there's contempt over it in a very serious way even though we joke about it, and my operating system may be wiring and years of wiring and we get to our programs coming up on attachment, is that this just feels comfortable for me. We started off, we've talked about Aristotle's quote, we are what we repeatedly do. So that idea is there's a comfort level of, I don't know, I just like doing this. There is a payoff, and I think there is a payoff. There is a transition to say I'm moving out of a PC operating system to a Mac, you gotta learn everything, or an Android. We're in that all day long with these phones and devices, and there's a learning curve. So part of that learning is to say, is there a different way in which I can operate? And I don't think it changes overnight, and at times I'm gonna go, is this really comfortable for me? Is this congruent with me? Mm -hmm. And what I'm, there's a whole systemic change in a lot of this say, I realize, and, and we've talked often about a two degree shift, just a two degree shift, not this big shift, I don't want to operate this anymore. I think it's good in my office we're going to look at what are possible payoffs that you get from doing what you do. Romans 7 straight away. Mm -hmm. You know, not doing what you should, doing what you shouldn't. And I start, let's just look, what are you getting out of it? I get nothing out of it. No, that's not true. Mm -hmm. There is a payoff. And then to say, you know, I think that's what, I, and usually it's going to be medicating. It just feels good. In a way, you and I are going to play some ball and, and then go to Taco Bell mm -hmm. and it just and watch a show together. We laugh and yeah. say, I would do that in your car in a New York minute. That's going to feel good, wouldn't it? Yep. We're just hanging. We do enough deep work, theological, right. therapy work. Can we just chill for a moment? Mm -hmm. So the payoff is neurochemically even, it feels like joy. It feels like happiness. Mm -hmm. I don't need any. When common sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. It's mm -hmm. the time to not think so deeply about that and say, we like it. Feels good. Am I doing any harm now? If you called and said, dude, Brit is ticked. Yeah. You know, and that can happen, you know. And so I'm you, just informing you, if I had made a whole oh, here homemade we go. meal and you knew I'd made a whole homemade meal mm -hmm. and then you went through the Taco Bell mm -hmm. and came home full from the Taco Bell. No, no, I ate the meal before. I ate the full homemade meal before because I need the energy to play ball. We you thought were able to eat a whole were coming meal afterwards. and then go play basketball? And then I play basketball. But you didn't get anything on, I thought you stopped every now and then afterwards. No, you that's, never, a, that's after. Well, you're stopping no, at Sonic the, and getting it. That's after study days when we get McDonald's every now and then. This is true. This is true. Because we often do study days at my house and you pass the McDonald's on your on way home. home. Oh, now and we've you switched will tell restaurants. Us, yeah, I am not stopping at the McDonald's yeah, today. That's, that's a different And that's then Britt and I have timed it before. Yeah. Oh, and wow. you 100% have been 100%, stopping at the McDonald's. 100%. No, I, yes, that's true. Uh, I think I think I'm gonna gotta make a turn to We're Mark just 10. really picking You're on you today. Really got I'm, me I'm good. just witnessing. <laughs> you got me good. Um, but I do think like that question, Lisa, that you're asking is so profound and it's incredibly important. Why do we keep doing it? Yeah. What so I think what's happening is there's something that is untrained and unsurrendered inside of our heart that is compromising mm -hmm. our 
our actions, right? So let's turn to Mark chapter 10. I think this is actually one of the most profound um, examples uh, in Jesus' experience in his ministry life. It's Mark 10, uh, and the subheading in my Bible just says the rich young ruler. And oh, yeah. You probably mm-hmm. know the story well. I'll summarize it. This uh, rich young ruler, which everything that we know about him seems to be a young uh, Jewish man who really understands the law. He understands his responsibilities. Um, he has done all the right things. The text actually tells us, and he goes to Jesus, and he and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Notice what Jesus says. Uh, here in verse 19, he goes, you know the commandments. So in one sense, he's looking at the man. He goes, listen, you you actually got this. What I think Jesus is actually doing is elevating the man. I think he's, he's wow. saying, listen, I'm going to put you up in the best possible position. And notice this. He says, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Do not defraud. Um, honor your father and mother. And then notice what the man, young man says. He said, teacher, I have kept all of these from my youth. In other words, Jesus, I'm betting 100. Like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm crushing it at this. And I want us to pay attention to the humanity. This is something, Lisa, that you've taught me so well. Look at the humanity of Jesus. Jesus is 100% divine and 100% human. Notice the, the text and the language. Looking at him, mm. loving him. He loved him. Yes. So the context of what he's going to say is love. And he said to him, you lack one thing. Go and sell all you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure. And he gives him the payoff. It's not like Jesus is like, do this and don't have. There's the ROI right there for a rich guy. This is the massive payoff. You will have treasure in heaven. And then even better, you don't have to do this alone. Then he says, then come, follow me. This is actually the exact same verbiage, phraseology that Jesus uses of the disciples. Come, follow me. You know, come be with me. Mm. Verse 22, this is tragic. But he was dismayed by this demand. And, and he went away grieving. Why? Because he had many possessions. And How? Jesus wasn't, do you think, just for a moment, I don't hear him putting a demand out. That's the rich young ruler's words. You're demanding. I think it's an invitation. It's a bid to come follow me. But Absolutely. He, his brain's already flipped it and said, you're demanding this. And That's, I understand. Yeah. No, and I think you're exactly right, Jim. And then what I think is so so amazing about the way Jesus frames it is Jesus is like, listen, the, the young man's like, I've done all of this for so long. And this is, if I were to paraphrase Jesus in the tone of what I think Jesus would say, this is how I think maybe a conversation would have gone with the young man. Mm. He goes, listen, man, you're crushing it. You're mm. 80% of the way there. Look at how difficult all these things are. And you have done that since your youth. And yet, and I think he looks at him lovingly in his eyes. And he says, and yet, there's 20%. There's this, there's this part of your heart that is unsubmitted, that hmm. is ungiven over to, to me. I want you to surrender it. And I want you to experience incredible joy. I want you to experience uh, treasure in a way that you could never experience elsewhere. But it's going to cost you something. you got to give up that 20%. Hmm. And... And that young man looks at the at the layout and goes, 80, 20. Hmm, I'm going to keep the 20. Why? Because that 20% was a hook that was hung on the human heart that was going to lead him down into a total pit of despair. Mm. Mm. And, and so this is like, why do I keep doing the things that I do? I think what Jesus' invitation for the rich young man is the invitation for us. There could be, and you guys have been such great friends with me, even the joking of the Taco Bell and this other stuff, there could be an unhealthiness to that. And it could be this 20%, and you could be like, Joel, are you trying to disconnect from your family? Are you trying to disconnect from your responsibilities? Are you trying, you know? And if that's the case, it's like 20%. That is what will absolutely lead you down a road of despair. Mm. And I think it's really important that we're able to evaluate and say, wait a minute, um, there's some things that I that I do that it's okay, like they're, they're they're good for us. But there are other things that the enemy uses that are actually deceitful, that are actually leading down a path of despair that we have to be careful of. So what is that twenty percent? And I think it's also like where am I attaching my hope to? Mm, where good. am I attaching my joy to? And I think a mistake that I sometimes make is there's this pleasure in the world mm-hmm. or there's this good thing in the world and I keep thinking if I could just have that good thing then it'll right all of my wrongs it'll fill up all of my insecurities it'll just make me feel so settled like yeah. I've arrived right and it might for a, a bit and it might mm-hmm. for a bit but mm-hmm. the problem with that is I am trying to write the script of my own life saying all of my hope is attached to this 
that may or may not be good for me, that may or may, may not ever come to pass, that may or may not ever happen. Mm -hmm. And if I attach my hope, my joy, you know, the, the kind of the premise of my life, if I attach it to something that may or may not happen, I am never going to get peaceful. So I'm, I'm never gonna feel peaceful. If, however, I learn I can attach my hope to God, I can still wish for these things. Sure. I can mm -hmm. still work toward these things. Right. But the foundation of my hope and where I get my joy, I have to attach it to God. And how I need to do that is by no longer trying to control outcomes. And what I mean by that is in my mind, I will say, if God is good, he will give me this outcome. And then when God doesn't give me that outcome, I start to question God's goodness. Mm. And if we question God's goodness, then we're not going to ever follow 100% after God. Yeah. And I don't know what was really going on with the rich young ruler, but I would have to think he was like, what will give me the security that I really want? Yeah. Is it Jesus? Because I'm not sure. Is it my possessions? That feels more certain. Yeah. So I'm going to go after my possessions. All the while, he just didn't realize that the very thing he was chasing after was the very thing that was going to be eventually unstable. It never stays the same if it's a thing of this world. Only yeah. God stays the same. Mm -hmm. And so he attached his security, his hope, his joy to, to something of this world that mm -hmm. will change. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how I sometimes process this. You know, we've done a really good job today just processing feelings. And mm. I think that's a really important conversation that we need to either have with a friend or a trusted mentor, or yeah. if, they, if we don't have someone like that, then we need to process even with ourselves and start asking ourselves questions and being honest about like, why do I do what I don't want to do? And write it out on paper yeah. because <laughs> it's going to be crucial that we learn to process these emotions because like what you said, Jim, if we don't work out what if we don't work through what yeah. we're walking mm -hmm. through, then it'll it'll turn sideways. It just will. Sitting with a uh, New York Times bestseller and a big author himself <laughs> now, and a future author, uh, author. Did you hear that? Yes. I, I said that it's coming. Uh, but seriously, journaling like I do this, and this is where I am faithful to to write and to sit down and just take my internal world and put it out on a page. The research would show, by the way, don't do that on a keyboard. That's another topic but to take a pen and write and say, what's going on in my internal world right yeah. now? What am I afraid of? What is it I wanna do? If we can develop true ongoing self-awareness to go, Socrates said, right, know thyself. To say, huh, and I'm telling you what surprised me coming out on the page, I'm like, that's in me. I think in self-correction, it'll save a lot of money in therapy to go, mm -hmm. I think this is what I need to do. Then phone up a trusted friend and say, hey, this came out of my journaling this morning. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Someone says, that sounds wacky or that sounds really good. But so much of that awareness is inside us. We just got on to onboard it. We've got to get in touch with it. It's right there. And instead of beating ourselves up mm -hmm. for what we feel like we're not doing right right now, yeah. I love the statement you've often told me, Jim, we need to get curious, not furious. Mm -hmm. So the exercise I would encourage you to do in your journal is spend some time thinking about what do I ultimately want? Not what do I want right now? That's so good. What do I ultimately want? And for me, I ultimately want peace, I ultimately want security, mm -hmm. and I ultimately want joy. Mm -hmm. And so if those are the things that I ultimately want, what do I need to address today that would be taking me away from the peace, the security, the joy? Mm -hmm. And honestly, what that question really is, what are the things about my life that are taking me away from the Lord? Yeah. And that are, that I'm, I'm grabbing onto because I feel like it's easier to drive through McDonald's and get, you know, a pack of fries to comfort me than sure. it is to go home, open up my Bible, put on some praise songs and get comfort from God. Mm. But if my ultimate desire is peace, security and joy, McDonald's french fries are not going to give me that. Only right. the Lord is going to give me It'll that. Give you high cholesterol. It, it will give you high cholesterol. And other things. Mm -hmm. And Taco Bell, too. Hey, okay, by the way, so. can I say something real quick on that? It's right out of Hebrews 12. 
this is no surprise to anyone at this table and probably not to our viewers and listeners, is there's a race to run with endurance. So fix your eyes on Jesus. Let's get after it. But then you need to stop. It's ready, set, stop, not ready, set, go in a race. And that is to look down and identify two words, as Joel knows so well in Greek, uh, of, of a sin that's entangled me or a weight that I need to let go of. So whatever this is, I hold these papers in my hands, Lisa or Joel or me, I say, this is what I think I want to do. Maybe it's come out of some journaling or conversation. Look down, just use some three-by-five cards or something or a salt and pepper shaker literally at the table and say, what is probably blocking me from self-awareness? Or if I have some awareness that I want to go do that, what's blocking me? What are the hurdles? It's right in the Rich Young Ruler passage. What might I have to give up or say no to? You know, the average person, if they do that simply with some paper, would be able to discover and say, yeah, that's probably going to block me. It's fear, fear of can I really do this and what will be the consequences, that scarcity mentality. Three or four sheets of paper and write out and say, okay, then that's where you can go sit with a good friend and say, i got to work through these blocks or barriers. I know I'm going to have to face these before I do what I think I want to do. And I want to just say the obvious. Some people might be wondering, is this biblical? Like, should we be caring about our emotions? Like, Mm. I just want to, like, maybe go back to Jesus in John chapter 11 with Lazarus, one of his Mm. dear friends that dies. Like, the shortest verse in the Bible, but the most, one of the most profound. Jesus wept. Mm. Jesus wept. He had emotions. Jesus loves. And then it's like, well, should I be processing and how should I process all of this? Well, another profound idea. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is processing the deepest, most serious emotions that are leading him to the cross. And I think it's super important that we see the narrative structure of this story. He takes the three closest disciples with him, and he says, pray Mm. for me. He says, pray Mm. for me, right? So there's a processing, there's a relationship, and then he goes into the deepest part of the garden, (laughs) and he says, well, I'm gonna spend now time between me and God the Father to be in communication and to to really process through these things. And the text says that Jesus was, I mean, his emotion, this is scientifically proven physiologically, that the weight of stress that he endured actually burst the blood capillaries in the head, which literally, literally made him sweat blood. Like that's Mm. actually what's happening. This is an expression of emotion. And it's really important that we know that the Bible does not reject emotions. It does not ask us to be stoic, robotic individuals. But it also does not tell us or lead us to be uh, driven by our emotions. They do not, like what you often say, Lisa, the emotions are, our feelings are, um, are indicators, indicators, not dictators. Not dictators yeah. yeah, and I think we see that model so profoundly in the life of Jesus. Hmm. And I think, you know, no matter what you identify in this processing time, if you're able to identify it yourself, I think, Jim, you've often said there's more help available and than hope. you have problems, more Mm -hmm. help and hope. And so there are therapy support groups, there are addiction support groups, you know, and there are, um, you've got probably people in your life who have connections with other opportunities for help. But if you're having a hard time identifying some of these things, that's why we have put together this series. And in this series, we are going to, of course, today we covered self-awareness. Why do I do what I don't want to do? Mm -hmm. But in episode two, we're going to cover what is really driving this behavior, addressing our emotions. In the third episode, self-deception. Why am I lying to myself? Episode four, deceiving others. Why am I lying to other people? Episode five, attachment theory, which you brought up. You know, what is my attachment style and how does that affect my life and my relationships? And then in episode six, we're covering God attachment. Mm. And of course, the resource that we have available for you in the show notes today, what is it like to do life with me? It's an assessment that you can sit down with a trusted friend. And really, I think that friend could help point out some things Mm -hmm. in a loving way to make us more aware of them. And it's a gift. It's a gift they're giving us Mm -hmm. because when they help us become more aware, we can then become more self-aware. So all of that in one episode. (laughs) Thank you, Joel, for your Taco Bell mission. Yeah. And you don't have Taco Bell shame at the end of this, do you? Because I am concerned. No, no. we're just no. getting curious, not furious, yeah, right? Yeah. We're That's practicing right. what That's we right. teach you. And it's good. a good exploration of the amb- the desire. Like, why do I do this thing, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so, yeah, no, it's been so helpful. And we want to acknowledge 
those struggles, but we don't want to be ruled by those exactly. struggles. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your brilliant theology. As always, Jim, thank you for your therapy and thank you for listening today. It's been a joy to have you with us.